This morning, my main scripture uh, text will be from Matthew 25, uh, verses 31 to 46, which I think is one of the most powerful passages in all of scripture about God's concern for the poor. But before I dive into the uh, book of Matthew, I want to share with you a little bit about my recent trip to Rwanda just a few months ago. I was there in March, and I wanted you to get a glimpse of how World Vision's child sponsorship programs are changing lives. But let me start with a word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, as, uh, as we read in John 3.16, you so love the world that you gave your one and only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And Lord, uh, we want you to come into our hearts today to open them to love the world as you love the world. Lord, help us to see the world's children as you see them, uh, to care about them as you care about them. And uh, we just pray that today, that you'd use this message to open our hearts. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, whenever I travel to our work around the world, I like to go and see both the before and the after. So I always go to communities uh, that have not had the opportunity to benefit from World Vision's programs to see how they are living and what their struggles are, hoping that we can bring some help to them as well. But then I go to the after communities, uh, communities where we've worked for 5, 10, or even 15 years to see the incredible difference that uh, our programs can make. And so that's what I did in Rwanda. And on my first stop to one of these before communities, I met a family with six girls. Uh, uh, the mom was named Olive, the dad was named Augustine, and they told me what was a pretty hard story. You see, this family had absolutely no access to clean water. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute, because that comment could just roll right over your head. I want you to imagine living your life, never in your life having taken a clean bath or a clean shower in clean water, never in your life. I've met 70-year-old men and women that have never had a clean shower. Never in your life having the luxury of turning on the tap and getting a glass of cool, cold water to quench your thirst. Never. Never in your life having access even to a toilet. Uh, one of the most basic elements of our dignity as human beings is that we, we have access to toilets. Now, just think about that for a minute. You see, this is the reality of almost 700 million people around the world. They don't have access to clean water. So I think we have a picture of the place where these girls get their water. It's a filthy pond, and these six girls go every day to fetch their water there. That's where they bathe. This water is teeming with bacteria, with parasites, diseases, and the girls, as a result, are almost always sick with some kind of ailment. While we were filming our video, uh, two cows literally walked out. That's me. Uh, the cows are on the left. I'm in the middle. <laughs> Two cows came out into the water while the girls were fetching, and uh, it was horrifying, but they defecated right in the water uh, about 10 feet away from the girls, and then the girls took this water back to their little house uh, for their drinking water. You see, they have no choice. They have no choice. In that same community, I met a woman named Francisca, another mother. Her son, Julius, was a high school senior honor student. He had just passed his national qualifying exams which placed him in the top 5% of all of Rwanda's youth. It guaranteed him a university education. I think we have a photo of Julius from his school here, his school papers. One day last year, Julius was fetching water, and the water looked cleaner farther out into the pond, and so he waded out deeper and deeper to try to get some cleaner water. But Julius didn't know how to swim. Most kids in Africa don't know how to swim. They, they don't have the programs we have here and so he got in over his head, and, and, and he drowned. There was no one around to help him, and this bright young boy's life was snuffed out while he fetched water. Now, I don't know about you, but what a heartbreaking way to lose your child. And this makes me angry. When I hear a story like this, and I hear lots of stories like this, it makes me angry because it could have been so easily avoided. You see, through World Vision's clean water programs, the cost to bring clean water to one person for life is $50, $50. Can you imagine if your son or your daughter died for lack of $50? It's just unimaginable. You see, this is a glimpse of the kind of communities and what we see in communities uh, 
that have not had the opportunity to benefit from the programs of World Vision. Well, the next day was a happier day. We drove up to Kagogo. Uh, it's a city about uh, two hours north of the capital city of Kigali in Rwanda. And that day, we dedicated a brand new clean water system that World Vision had brought into the community. Uh, the new water system brought clean water to more than 5,000 people who lived there. And the celebration that day uh, brought out the mayor, the governor, and about 1,000 grateful people had come out to celebrate. Now, imagine how you would celebrate if you had lived your entire life without clean water, and finally, finally, it was, it, it was in your village, and your children no longer had to drink that filthy water, and you could take a clean bath, and you could live with dignity. Uh, that's the joy that these people experience. We spent that whole day talking to families in the community whose lives had been changed. Now, their lives have been changed because of the clean water, but also because World Vision does so much more than just bring clean water to communities. We have uh, health and nutrition programs for mothers and children to make sure that kids get a healthy diet. We help with basic education. We try to make sure that all of the children stay in school and get an education. Many of the families receive microloans and attend business training classes. We form savings groups and farmers cooperatives, teaching them how to work together, how to, how to manage their money. I want you to listen to a quote from one of the families we visited, uh, a couple named Fassien and Vestine. They have four children. That's a picture of their family. Vestine, the wife, said that before World Vision came, and this is a quote, she said, we were living on the dark side of life, but World Vision brought us out. World Vision brought us out. You see, their lives had changed as a result of all of the work. They now have an income from selling milk uh, from the cows that they were able to buy with a microloan. The clean water has dr drastically changed the health and cleanliness of their children. They were able to even build a new house with real glass windows, something quite rare in that part of the world. I met their 15-year-old daughter, Isabel. She's one of our sponsored children. That's her standing at the blackboard. They had literally turned part of their wall in their new house into a blackboard because education was so important to, to them. Well, she's an honor student, and she literally stood there leading me through uh, differential calculus equations. I felt like I was standing next to Stephen Hawking. Uh, <laughs> and this young girl is so bright, such a bright light, she wants to be a medical doctor someday, and I believe she will do it. Her father is incredibly proud of Isabel. Here's what he told me. We were people living without dreams. Imagine that, living without dreams. World Vision took us out of poverty. They changed our mindset. One of the reasons we help people out of poverty, one of the ways we help them, is we take the gospel with us as well. We tell them that God loves them, that, they, that, that there's a loving God who cares about them and their family. We try to introduce them to Jesus. That's what it takes to change mindsets. Poverty is much more than just a lack of material things. Poverty is emotional, cultural, spiritual at the deepest level. And if you don't work in all of those domains, uh, lives don't change. Communities don't change. So it's all of that. What I wanted you to see from these just brief snapshots were, are the incredible differences between the despair of the families I visited in the before community and the hopefulness and optimism of the families in these after communities. You see, our strategy is not to give handouts. Uh, we want to help the community help themselves. We try to give people a hand up, not a hand out. We learned uh, 60 years ago that just giving things to people does not help them escape from poverty. Uh, you give them a hand up, you, you equip them to care for themselves and their own families. And after about 15 years, World Vision says goodbye to the community because we've We've helped them stand on their own two feet, and we can move to a community that needs us more. This is the kind of difference that child sponsorship programs make uh, through our work. Okay, but the most important question for us to answer this morning is, why is World Vision so passionate about helping the poor to begin with? Uh, and the answer, of course, comes directly from Scripture. If I had time today, and I do because I can preach right until the evening service, uh, <laughs> I could take you from Genesis to Revelation, and I would show you a very, very bright thread of God's concern for the poor that goes throughout the entire Bible. It's one of the remarkable things about Scripture. Uh, imagine even three and 4,000 years ago, God speaking to people about His concern for the poor. 
uh, which at the, in that day and age was a radical idea to care for your neighbor. But in my view, the most profound statement about God's love for the poor in all of the Bible is in Matthew 25. It's, and it's spoken in Jesus' words. And this is the sobering account of what is actually going to happen at the, at the last judgment. Important to understand, this is not a parable. This is a prediction and a promise. Jesus is literally telling us what's going to happen at the final judgment. And like much of what Jesus said and did, it was shocking and unexpected when he said it to the disciples in the first century. And it's still pretty shocking uh, and unexpected today when we read it in the right context. Let's read it. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He'll put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are, who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you, you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then in verses 41 to 46, Jesus goes on to say what will happen to those who did not show compassion for the least of these during their lifetimes. And the conclusion of this passage is rather terrifying, frankly. Jesus ends with this, depart from me, depart from me, you who are accursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. You know, every time I read that passage, it sends a little bit of a chill up my spine. Uh, I take a deep breath. And I think you can see why uh, I said that this passage is kind of shocking and unexpected. Well, the shocking part that is that Jesus was literally saying that at the final judgment, the criteria he would use to determine who would be rewarded with eternal life with God would be whether they devoted themselves to caring for the hungry, the thirsty, the thick, the sick, the poor, the prisoner, and the stranger. Now, there's a lot of deep theology here, and I don't have time this morning to get into all of it, but let me just make this observation about this passage. This is a passage about the final exam, and there was just one question on it. What did you do for the poorest of the poor in our world? What did you do for the least of these? Now, let me emphasize this. I believe with all my heart that Scripture tells us we are saved by faith and not by works. Nothing we do will contribute to our salvation. It is the free gift of God. But Jesus seemed to be telling his disciples that the evidence of authentic faith is the love and compassion we show for the least of these in our world, those who are hungry and thirsty, strangers, homeless, sick, in prison. You see, we are not earning our salvation. We are demonstrating our salvation to a watching world. Well, that was a shocking part of Matthew 25. It, it is kind of shocking to read these words. And, and I'm going to let your pastor clear up my bad theology next week if he needs to. Uh, but let me speak to the unexpected part of this passage. The unexpected part is the almost mystical idea that Jesus so closely identifies with the poor and the downtrodden in our world. He tells us that when we love and care for them, it is the exact same thing as loving and caring for Jesus himself. Think about that for a minute. If this is true, we can never look at a person who is needy in the same way because somehow, mysteriously, we are actually looking at Jesus himself. You know, Mother Teresa, one of my heroes, uh, once said this. She said, when I look into the eyes of the poor, I see Jesus staring back at me in his most distressing disguise. Jesus disguised as the poor in our world. So here's the profound implication of this. 
if this is true, the Jesus we worship every Sunday, the Jesus who hears our prayers each day, that same Jesus is without water today in Rwanda. That same Jesus is hungry today on the streets of Calcutta. He's a victim of human trafficking in Asia. He's fleeing from Central, he's, he's fleeing from Central American violence, fleeing from his village. He's homeless today on the streets of Olympia. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, right now is suffering among the Syrian refugees, and he's crying out to his church, he's crying out to you and to me for help. You see, this is how deeply Jesus identifies with the poor. The founder of World Vision, Dr. Bob Pierce, is famous for a little prayer that he wrote back in the early 1950s, and I'm sure you've heard it before. It goes like this, let my heart be broken by the things that break the heart of God. Let my heart be broken by the things that break the heart of God. You know, I think Bob Pierce understood that Matthew 25 was about God's broken heart. And he prayed over and over that God would give him that same broken heart for the poor. It was the only way he could continue doing his work. And I know over 20 years at World Vision, I've prayed that prayer many times because eventually your heart forms a little scar tissue. It gets broken and it heals. It gets broken and it heals. And at some point you have to pray, Lord, if you don't break my heart again, it won't break. It won't break. I've seen too much of this. And I think that's what Bob Pierce was praying, break my heart again. But you know, it's really hard for us to have a broken heart for people that may live 10,000 miles away from Olympia, Washington. If I could take you with me to 50 or 60 different countries to hear the stories of the least of these, to sit in their homes, to laugh with them, to cry with them, your hearts would be broken too by what you saw. But I can't do that. But what I can do is take you on an imaginary journey. This is all going to take place in your mind. If you'll just let me do a little thought experiment with you this morning. Now, many of you did the Matthew 25 challenge in the last week or so, and that's terrific because it, it's designed to give you a glimpse uh, of what it actually feels like to be poor. So if that was the 101 level course, I'm going to give you the 301 level Matthew 25 journey this morning because I want to help you feel the despair and the hopelessness that is the daily reality of the poorest people in the world. So you have to follow me now with your imagination on this Matthew 25 journey. All of this is going to take place right here in the community in which you live. And one by one, I'm going to take just seven things away from you uh, and your family. And when I'm done, you should have a vivid picture in your mind of how more than two billion people live around the world. But I'm going to warn you at the beginning, buckle your seatbelts, you're going to find this imaginary exercise kind of disturbing and maybe even a little heartbreaking as we get into it. Okay, so get ready. Here is the first takeaway, the first step on your imaginary journey, and it's a pretty easy one. I'm going to take away your clothing. Now, that usually uh, junior high kids giggle at that, uh, but I want you to imagine that except for the clothes on your back, that all the rest of your clothing is gone. It's all been taken to the goodwill. All of your closets have been empty. You have no more choices to make in the morning. The men are saying, sweet, you don't have, to, don't have to worry about what to wear in the morning. You have no variety. You have only one pair of shoes, but you're lucky to even have one pair of shoes because millions of people don't even have one pair of shoes. So now you have to wear what you have on right now. Whatever you wore to church today, every day from now on, that's what you're going to wear. When it gets dirty, well, you've got to take it off and wash it and wait while it's being cleaned and then put it back on again. Now, I'm sure you can imagine it's a bit embarrassing to wear the same thing to work every day or school if you're a student, and you start to become pretty self-conscious about how you look around other people, uh, regardless of where you work or go to school. Because remember, on this imaginary journey, it's only your family that is losing uh, these things. You still go to your workplace, you still go to your school every day, just like you always did, but none of your friends and coworkers are losing these things that I'm taking away from you. Okay, so losing your wardrobe has made you somewhat embarrassed and discouraged, maybe a little bit of a hit to your self-esteem, uh, but you can still manage to cope with life. I mean, not too much has changed in your life. But now I'm afraid I have to take away the second thing, and that's energy. Heat, electricity, light, power, and your vehicles, which run on power, 
Did you know that just 9% of the people on the planet own an automobile? 9%. So you're one of the 9% probably if you're here today. Uh, well, losing energy is a much bigger problem than losing the clothes in your closets because now your house is always dark. Uh, uh, it gets dark when the sun goes down. Usually it's too hot or too cold depending on the weather. And of course, you can now only wash your clothes by hand, no washing machine. The showers are cold too, no heat, no hot water. And you have to do the dishes by hand. And of course, there are no stereos, no radios, no smartphones, no computers, no internet, and of course, no television. There's no refrigerator either, no stove for cooking, so you now have to build a fire if you want to heat anything up. And don't forget, because there are no cars, you have to walk everywhere that you go. So life is pretty miserable now with takeaway number two, and you're really starting to begin to feel really deprived, miserable, and uncomfortable. But as they say, you've still got your health, and so you and your family uh, power through, and you adapt as best you can. But just as you're starting to adjust to all of this, I have to come away and take away number three, and it's a big one. It's your water, your clean water. Now, this is a real problem because now you have to walk over a mile for your water to a muddy pond, just like the girls I showed you earlier. You've got to fill up these big bottles and jerry cans with dirty water and lug them all the way home. And it's not just the hard work, it's the time that it takes. It takes hours and hours every day, multiple trips, backbreaking work just to get a few gallons of water. And you need water to drink, to cook with, to bathe, to wash your clothes, to do all of those things. But since the water is dirty and filled with bacteria and parasites, it makes you sick when you drink it. That brings fever and discomfort, nausea, diarrhea, and of course, without water, the toilets don't work either. And at this point, you don't really care about those little things. Wearing the same clothes every day doesn't seem like a very big deal now. Forget about washing the clothes or doing the dishes just not very important uh, when you don't have clean water at all. So now there's no showers, not even cold showers. You're always dirty, and you feel even dirtier, and you're ashamed. You're ashamed all the time. It seems like you're always at the doctor's office, too, because some member of the family is sick, but at least you've got a doctor to go to and uh, medicine available. But now I'm afraid I have to take away another thing. And remember, our deal was seven, and I've only taken away three things from you. Number four is your house. Don't worry, though. I'm not going to leave you homeless without shelter. I'm just going to trade your current home or apartment for a two-room shack about 400 square feet, 20 by 20. Might look something like that. It has no glass windows, no beds, no furniture except for a couple of wooden benches and a couple of wooden chairs. And your whole family now sleeps on the floor in the same room. Now, if you're a parent, the worst part of all of this is having to see your children live this way. They don't laugh anymore. They cry and they whimper more. Their faces are often blank and their eyes vacant. Their little spirits have just been crushed because life is almost unbearable for them now. But you know, I've only taken away four things, and believe it or not, you're still better off than millions of people on our planet. Takeaway five is pretty devastating, though. It's food. No more grocery store, no more fast food or restaurants. This is the biggest challenge so far because now you have to live off the land. You can grow a few things in your yard, but not 12 months a year, and forget any sense of nutrition. So you have to, be, you have to become resourceful now to get food. And you find out that you can pick through your neighbor's garbage. It's amazing what people throw away. Stale bread, half-eaten apples, wilted lettuce and vegetables, occasionally some expired canned goods. Your neighbor's trash is now your treasure. You know, I've been to garbage dumps that are 100 acres in size with thousands of children just scavenging in those garbage dumps for a little bit of yogurt or a scrap of food. Uh, this really happens around the world, that people that live off garbage. Well, back to your family, just when you think you've sunk as low as you can, sickness and disease now start to hit all of you with a vengeance. Your immune systems are weakened and they can't cope with even ordinary colds and viruses or bacterial infections. You're even dealing with things like lice and skin diseases, parasites, thing, things you didn't even know existed before this. And over time, you notice that the weakest member of your family, your little four-year-old daughter, has gotten 
sicker and sicker and sicker because of the bad water, the poor nutrition. She's, not, she's just not doing well at all. And I'm terribly sorry, but takeaway number six is health care. Incredibly, with no doctor to turn to, you have to watch helplessly as your daughter's health keeps going downhill. On top of malnutrition, she now has some kind of violent dysentery, but you're literally powerless to do anything. There's no doctors, no medicine, nothing that you can do. And she just keeps slipping further away every day until one morning, she just doesn't wake up. She just doesn't wake up. You see, her little body couldn't continue to fight off the infections. Devastated. Devastated doesn't begin to describe what you might be feeling right now. In your grief, all you can do is weep and cry and wail, call out to God in your suffering. It feels like you're invisible. You just feel invisible. Why didn't someone somewhere do something to help your little girl or to stop your family's suffering? How can this be happening to us? Your whole family is trapped in a nightmare, and it seems impossible to wake up from it. And maybe now you're wondering, what else could I possibly take away from you? You've lost everything, and it, it just couldn't get any worse. Well, not quite. There's one more thing. The seventh and last takeaway is hope. But you see, you've already lost hope. You lost hope weeks ago, even before your little girl died. Hope for the future. Hope for your family. Hope for your children. Hope that tomorrow might be better than today. You see, this is just a glimpse of what hopelessness feels like. Can you feel it kind of in your gut right now, the hopelessness? Well, I'm going to stop there with this little journey, and I, I'm sorry that I took you through all of this because it's, it's even hard for me to preach it, let alone uh, to hear it for the first time. But I wanted each of you to actually feel just a little bit of what it feels like to really, really be poor in our world. For some reason, poverty just doesn't seem as horrifying when we hear about it happening to somebody else thousands of miles away in another culture in another part of the world. But that is just the kind of unimaginable poverty that is the daily reality for millions and millions of families and children. They're just not our families. You see now more clearly why Jesus had such compassion for the least of these in Matthew 25. And, and that prayer of our founder now becomes a little bit more real. Let my heart be broken by the things that break the heart of God. Surely God's heart is broken when he sees his children living in conditions like this. But there's something else that should have bothered you during our Matthew 25 journey. There was something you might have wondered about as those seven things were being taken away from you. Where were your Christian brothers and sisters during this whole thing? As you sank into total despair, where were they? Why didn't they help? The answer is they were still right there in your neighborhood. In fact, they drove by your house each day in their cars as they went about their lives, driving to church, taking their kids to soccer games, going to movies, going out for dinner. You see, nothing had changed for them. You were just out of sight and out of mind, and they just looked the other way. It was almost as if you were invisible, invisible in your community. I suspect that's exactly how the least of these feel around the world. They feel invisible. And they also wonder why their Christian brothers and sisters seem to look the other way when all they need is just a little bit of help. In my more than two million air miles of travel over the last 20 years, I've met thousands of the poorest of the poor, these brothers and sisters of ours around the world. And I am just so amazed by their courage, by their perseverance, by their ability to cling to hope in the face of almost hopeless circumstances. Meeting the poor and being with the poor has taught me a great deal about faith and about God, and it shouldn't be surprising because if Jesus is really present with the poor, that would be a good place to learn about him. I learned a profound truth about how God works in our world from a very, very poor woman named Octaviana a few years ago, and I'll just share her story my wife Renee and I met Octaviana high up in the Andes Mountains of Peru. She was a widowed mother who had just lost her husband nine months earlier from a respiratory disease, no medicine, no doctor. 
In the midst of her grieving, she was trying to raise her three children in the harsh environment of the high Andes. I think 14,000 feet is the height of Mount Rainier, so that'll give you an idea how harsh the climate was. She lived in a mud hut, and she was farming the land and raising her livestock, but now without the help of her husband. It was a difficult life, exactly the kind of poverty I just tried to describe to you this morning. And Octavia cried that day as we prayed together. We prayed in her little hut. And I suspect that she cried every day as she prayed to God. She told me that she prayed each day that God would not forget her or her children as they suffered and scraped by on the very brink of despair. She said that she prayed God would somehow hear her cries, see her suffering, and that God would send someone to help. God, please send help. And that's when I had this revelation. It was early in my time at World Vision. The incredible truth that she'd been praying and God had sent me. You see, I was the answer to Octaviana's prayer. 6,000 miles away from my home in Seattle, 14,000 feet up in the Andes Mountains, God had sent me there that day as the answer to her desperate prayers. Can you imagine that God answered her prayer by sending the president of World Vision directly to her mud hut? Now that's an answer to prayer right there. That woman is a prayer warrior. But you see, that's when I understood this is exactly how God works in our world. It's exactly how he works, isn't it? You see, right now, people all across the world, all across Olympia, right in your neighborhoods, people are praying. They're crying out to God for help. And God answers those prayers by sending us. You know, centuries ago, St. Teresa of Avila understood this, and she wrote these inspirational words. She said this, Christ has no body but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet, yours are the eyes. You are his body. There's something very deeply spiritual in all of this. This is really what Matthew 25 is all about. You see, God chooses to send us to answer the cries of the hungry, the thirsty, the naked, the sick, the prisoner, and the stranger. And somehow, in the mystery of our faith, he tells us that when we respond to them with our love and compassion, it's actually Jesus himself that we're loving. Now today, uh, when you came in, you were given one of these cards. Maybe I'll ask you to take it out today uh, and look at this card because with the support of your pastoral team, we're giving all of you an opportunity today to be the answer to a child's prayer somewhere in the world. We've got several hundred kids waiting to be sponsored at our tables in the lobby. And all you have to do is uh, fill out this card, uh, put the information on it, take it back there after the service, and you can select a little boy or a little girl, or maybe one of each, depending on how God has blessed you. You know, my own son, Andy, and his wife, just a young couple starting out, they sponsor 15 kids through World Vision. Uh, it's amazing to see their compassion. The cost of sponsoring a child is less than a cup of coffee a day. That's about what it costs. Many of the kids who are waiting to be sponsored live in the same kind of poverty I described this morning. Let me ask you, is there room in your heart today for a child, for one of these kids? You know, sometimes when I ask people to respond like this, I like to imagine that I had 200 of these kids on stage with me today, and they were all looking out at you, uh, and I was asking you if you would take one of them into your heart. I know every one of them would leave with a sponsor, and maybe you'd be fighting over them by the time the service ended. Uh, and they'd be looking out at you, and they'd be saying, is he the one? Is she the one? Is this the day that my life will change? Is this the day? You know, just like Octaviana in Peru, these kids who are waiting have been praying to God that he would send help to their community, to their family. Wouldn't it be amazing if God chose you today to be the answer to their prayers? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father,